Hi everyone, my name is Dorian. I'm hosting MedTech Trends. Today we have with us Dr. Patrick Anquetil. He is the Portal Instrument Chief Executive Officer. Patrick brings with us, with him, 20 years of experience leading high-tech bioengineering companies from lab to the marketplace and building world-class teams. Prior to founding Portal Instruments, he was also co-founder at SynapDX Corp, an autism diagnostic company, and Eritas Inc., a venture in the field of blood glucose monitoring. He began his career as a science and nanotechnology equity research analyst at Susquehanna International Group, authoring and marketing industry and equity research reports to hedge funds and portfolio managers. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to a great conversation. Wonderful. So today we want to uh, talk about uh, a few things. I'd love to get your perspective on the the team that you brought with you to work uh, and do the innovative, uh, fantastic uh, designs uh, on the new uh, drug delivery systems at Portal Instruments. I also want to get your perspective on what all of that means for, for patients and also for medical care a little bit more broadly and to see what your thoughts are on the future of, of the company and, and maybe how the healthcare space is going uh, a little bit more broadly as well. But first, I'm very curious, where did the name Portal Instruments come from? That's a great question. In fact, you know, it's funny. So what we're doing, we're trying to replace knee and syringes with something that hopefully will be better uh, than this very barbaric way to administer medicines. And when we started the company, uh, you know, we're a bunch of engineers and, you know, we tried to think, well, where could we find a name that didn't have like inject or, you know, anything techy and geeky. In fact, you know, all our competitors actually uh, had names like that and we felt that this was a great opportunity for us to, to differentiate and um, believe it or not our biologist actually uh, one of the inventor of the technology she came up with the name and so portal as you know is a science fiction uh, or, or term used in science fiction all the time it's basically uh, a gate that allows you to actually go in, in between two is a two universes or two spaces a portal can be either uh, you know something to get into space or or to uh, to get into another universe so that's how it came and we said well you know in our case really what we're trying to do is to bridge the world of medicine uh, and and bring it into the patients so we can be the portal that allows you to do that so that's how it came uh, so it's pretty you know, a little geeky but uh, also uh, not too techy at the same time so we, we loved it once we once to realize that once it came up actually we saw this is the right thing I love it. I love the the science fiction part of it as well because I'm a huge astronomy fan in science yeah. fiction. I love all those space black movies. hole, you know, maybe the black hole approach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. And in terms of uh, your background, because you your roots are in in research. Obviously, you've done your your PhD in the area of medical device development, if I'm uh, remembering correctly. And and how did you make the transition from research? to then uh, leading a company. Did you always want to do that? You know, I think I wanted always to do that, but actually didn't know it. Or I kind of had pushed it aside. I mean, I remember, as I'm from France, I'm sure as you can tell from my accent, and um, when I was growing up in France, I was always a little bit, um, you know, sort of uh, not wanting to conform uh, with the system. And, uh, and as such, you know, one way you can do that is start your own company. And I said, oh, you know, if I had my own company, I wouldn't have this stupid policy. I would do something, you know, I'd be faster and so on. But, you know, it kind of, I guess, was in the back of my mind. I, I took a very uh, sort of an almost traditional approach. I did a, an undergraduate degree at ETH in Zurich, then I did a master's, it actually was combined. Uh, and then I was like, well, actually, research is interesting. I, it would be sad to stop now. So I want to just do a PhD and end up going to MIT. Um, and I think what happened really when I went to MIT is that I fell into this uh, world of entrepreneurship you know this was back during the uh, the dot-com bubble everyone was starting companies left and right it actually wasn't was not just only in it services anything any idea could be a great company and certainly there was a great appetite and a lot of capital actually to do that so that's kind of what that thing started actually and i think the transition really happened serendipitously i had a uh, an opportunity to work as you mentioned 
um, in a field of equity research, which is a wonderful field, you know, for all the scientists out there who are intrigued by business but don't necessarily have you know, the knowledge or the skills. Um, basically, you get hired to talk about the things that you are an expert in. And then all the finance stuff you can actually pick up on the side. In my case, they kind of trained us for two weeks. So that was it. <laughs> you know, uh, So very quickly, you can actually gain that. And, and then it becomes an unusual gateway, actually, to get into this field of business and bring a lot of value. And I think that's true for other areas, actually, as well. I mean, you can get into consulting, get into banking. Uh, those things are really, really great for all the scientists out there who, who want to know more about business. So, mm -hmm. um, and it was it was a, a bit of a gradual transition for you, right? Like you were, yes, it was, yeah. you were doing research, and you obviously, as a researcher, there, there's a natural inclination toward curiosity and trying to figure out how different things work, and and exploring and kind of pushing boundaries. So that nature, I think, feeds well into the entrepreneur role. But at the same time, there's a there's a big gap in terms of the way that you think as which is very myth, methodologically and analytically as a researcher compared to as an entrepreneur, it's more like you have an idea, you just kind of have to chase it and build things as you go. There's more of that element to it. I think actually, they're much more similar, but I think it deals with what goes on in your head and that you don't think you can actually do it. But in principle, if you distill it back down to the first principle, um, the way you really do entrepreneurship, you're, you're basically, um, you're asking very, um, very clear questions that lead you to results that will basically raise the value of the company and you fundraise on that, right? And I think, I think you can literally approach it like a, a clinical uh, experiment uh, and and, uh, and and so and, and pass it like but I think oftentimes um, it's like learning a new language huh? uh, there's all these terminologies that you don't know what they mean uh, and and so and so that can feel daunting and but in principle uh, the essence is, is similar so one way to overcome that uh, which is actually my case um, you can be very fortunate and and find mentors uh, that literally show you the method. That's what happened to me. I, so, so my path actually was very winding. And I think again here, I actually, um, maybe it took me some time to get convinced to either start my own thing or I had actually, which is actually the other thing, which is actually very true. I had such great opportunities coming out of MIT that I actually wanted to pursue those before actually starting my own thing. So um, this equity research was wonderful. I went to business school after that just to pursue it further. Uh, I really felt that this was a good time just to you know, step back and really sort of get a broader view of business. But again, it's not required. And, and really I agonize as a student, you know, MBA or not MBA, at the end of the day, you know, it's a very personal discussion uh, decision. It, it doesn't matter. It's, it's really you do it because you want to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, with, without an MBA, you can do all of this. And then, what happened post MBA? I was very fortunate to meet uh, this legend uh, in the field of diagnostics, uh, Stan Lapidus. Stan is, is just very famous because he started a company called Cytic. Uh, Cytic uh, developed um, or industrial the method to actually collect samples for pap smears. Um, before that, it was very uneven to get actually uh, those samples. Um, and so he sold that company for six billion to Hologic back in the 90s. So that's why he's a legend wow. in that okay. field. Uh, and then did other companies like Helico's uh, Exact Sciences, for example, that now is actually really killing it. Uh, and then so he and I, plus another guy named uh, Jeff Luber, uh, started Synaptics. And I was certainly the most junior guy on the team, but I was a founder nonetheless. Uh, he showed me, he and Jeff actually really showed me the method. And then when the opportunity for Portal came, I basically applied the method step by step. So, so I think that's really one of the great uh, advantage or sort of the serendipitous thing that happened to me. Uh, and I think, I think that's kind of the best way uh, to do it. Of, on the other hand, I mean, you can be very talented and you can figure it on your own. I mean, it wasn't me, but I, I know there are people out there who might have the world is one of those guys and, and so on. So multiple ways to get there, yeah. You know, it's really wonderful hearing um, hear you talking about your experiences and starting out in this entrepreneurial road and sharing all that information. I, I, I can tell you're very passionate about sharing this knowledge because there, there really are a lot of very talented, very smart uh, uh, researchers um, who are trying to figure out how to bring their ideas to life and and partnering with other people, finding mentors, uh, learning how to think like an entrepreneur. That's really the key to success in doing that. Yes, that's right. I think mm -hmm. you have to take the plunge. I mean, I um, you know went to Harvard Business School, which notoriously this may be less true today, but but in the past really had very few risk takers um, because you know, if you've spend you know, all your time in consulting and banking and you're getting all those very rich salaries. So you're kind of handcuffed in a way. 
um, and, and this idea is that, you know, you could take a year, it could be a year without uh, any income. I mean, I think, so in the case of Synaptics, we raised money in 2009 when, uh, you know, I mean, the whole world was blowing up um, and we had the best people Literally, we had like the best folks you can imagine. With Stan, who was the CEO, like most famous diagnostics guy. Um, we had people from Children's Hospital, top of their field. We had Lou, uh, Lou Conkel, who basically discovered the gene for muscular dystrophy. We had Zach Kohane, who's sort of this like legend in bioinformatics. Even the clinician was a legend on his own, Lenny Rappaport. And yet, you know, it still took us a year to raise money. So for a year, actually, I had zero income. And so if it wasn't for my wife, <laughs> supported us and by the way we have no kids uh, to make things <laughs> much easier but I think I think that's the challenge and I think oftentimes I have, I have a lot of friends um, who are you know who have had those those very comfortable situation really are very entrepreneurial people but actually feel that the risk is just too high and, and it's just just I'm waiting for the right opportunity to come and I think that's very very hard uh, and I don't know what the answer is actually to overcome that because at the end of the day, you have to convince yourself that, yeah, the risk may, may not be as high as you think. Uh, and, and I think what I tell everyone, look, you've got only one life and that's very true, uh, at least from what we know, uh, and just make the best out of it. And, and, you know, our careers are so short if you think of it, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. what, what's 30 years? <laughs> it, it flies right? by, absolutely. It definitely flies by. So I want to ask you about one more thing that you just mentioned, and then we'll we'll jump into a little bit more in the specifics of portal instruments and the and the technology that's sure. being developed there. You mentioned that you had this this incredible team that you were working with, yes. um, and it, it, do you think like would it still have been as big of a success if you didn't have this really you know dream team with you? Let's suppose you know a lot of people might not be able to to access the same uh, caliber of people. Or, you know, it really depends on what's available, the timing, resources, the environment, and so on. I, I couldn't agree more with, with those comments. I mean, I pinch myself every day um, that, you know, we have all those folks actually wanting to work with us, in particular in this economy, when they have so many other options and so on. And so I think here really the secret source is that it really starts with culture. Um, you want to create an environment that um, rewards people for um, yeah, sort of, you know, for leaving the values, basically. And, and, and those values have to be around, uh, you know, uh, bringing something to the table, like your expertise, that being valued, uh, bringing the passion, actually, as well, uh, and doing something bigger than yourself. I think, I think one of the, the challenges I think I, I had, and I think a lot of my, uh, um, you know, colleagues who have PhDs have kind of the same challenge, which is as a PhD, you're kind of like the army of one. You're trained to do everything yourself. And this concept of division of labor is completely foreign. Uh, and and that's, I think that's very, very, very hard. I mean, so nowadays, actually, there are some projects that are you know, much more team-based. But I think this very concept of division of labor and that implicitly you need to trust he or she who comes with their expertise to do their part is, is really what you need to let go on and, and make, make happen. So, so I think in our case, it's a with culture. We make it a culture that's, that's not only... You know that my my goal, whoever comes through and 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 becomes part of the team, my goal is that if God forbid they want to leave, which we hope they don't, but you know things happen, uh, that they come out better than what they were before than when when they joined us. Um, so we so I think here what this means is that from a you know domain perspective, that really there is top of the art, like, like state of the art, they get basically that knowledge and are able to, um, to feel like they're growing actually as well. And I think then also, you want to make it a culture that's as flat as possible, push down the decision making, uh, you know, to the people actually who really know what's going on. Um, and in fact, we're doing something very surprising here. We even have the startup within the startup. You know, it's, it's basically all organic, um, uh, in particular in areas like integration where, uh, you know, you want the mechanical engineer to talk to the electrical engineer to talk to the design engineer. If you put in any friction there, it's not going to happen, and then the product will suffer. So here again, we have this kind of concept that uh, we want to basically push down the decision making. We treat everyone like adults. Uh, they they kind of are. I wouldn't say brainwashed, that would be not nice to say, but you know, we kind of say, look, you know, you're, it's your company as much as it's ours, your shareholders, so make the right decision as if it was, you know, for your own, you know, personal budget and so on. And, you know, by and large, people are doing those type of, of very good decisions, so it's great. So I think, so, so number two, and then certainly you have to make it a fun 
advancement actually as well and, and make it, you know, work can be uh, sort of very, um, you know, it can be very consuming. I think, I think you need to make it fun and not take yourself too seriously also at the end of the day. Uh, so I can tell you also how we recruited those folks if you're interested in. Uh, no, absolutely. That was actually going to be my, my next question, but I, I'm also glad that you mentioned that it has to be a bit of a fun environment because we do spend so much time at work. And I think one of the things that, um, that I found about, uh, about the, this industry, this healthcare industry, from, from my experience is that you really do have a lot of people that are extremely passionate yes. about the work that they're doing and uh, they, they love the work. You know, it's not, it's not just running a business. It's not just to trying to make a profit or, you know, to try to build a company. It, it's really just what is, there's an end goal. There's a vision, there's an end goal and there's a real passion that goes into it. Yes. And yes. people after spending so much time, they want yep. to enjoy it. And, and so the way you do that, if I'm just going to move the camera because this is my no. boardroom right here, <laughs> it really starts with the mission. Okay. Uh, and the vision. So all, we're in the middle, needle free device space. So of course we want to remove every needle and syringe. I mean, that's how, that's the vision. And then here really the mission is to, uh, you know, improve the experience for those patients on those therapies that, you know, uh, you know chronic you know, needle, needle injection and so on. So I think, I think, mm -hmm. and you always go back to the mission, right? At, at the end of the, I think the vision is just there to set the framework, but I think the mission is really what, what matters. And, um, and you want people to make decisions with regards to the mission. Okay, is this going to have the mission? Yes. Okay, great. Then let's do it. If not, then it's it's not essential. For this we shouldn't be doing this this mm -hmm. uh, this particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, th I also find. I mean, I think we're getting very philosophical here on a on a, on a Wednesday afternoon. But I think people also <laughs> want meaning at the end of the day. You know, I think I think uh, we're all in search of meaning, and um, you know, developing one's career is one way to do that. Uh, certainly, I mean, we spend way more time. Uh, you know, uh, at work than we actually do with our own families. I think finding meaning in, in your work is very important. Um, I think we're very fortunate in the field of medical devices and, and life sciences as a whole that, yeah, at the end of the day, there's a patient who's going to benefit from, from all the hard work. And, and, and we, when, when we do get patients in to come in and talk to the team, I mean, that's, that's the feedback certainly also that we, we get as well. So that's very motivating, I think, I think too. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. In terms of portal instrument, um, is there something that you feel makes the, the team unique? Yes. Yeah, I think we have. A, so here's what we do. And, and so it is, it is a fun balancing ad. We're bringing the very young, enthusiastic, you know, MIT engineers or MIT types. And of course, we hire, you know, from Harvard and uh, Northeastern and all, all the great, great universities here in Boston. And they come in with new approaches, uh, you know, state-of-the-art knowledge, and then we pair them with folks who've done 20 plus years, uh, who have 20 plus years experience in their field. So that's kind of the mix that you have. And then we have a few in-between people, but by and large, it's kind of how we structure the team. And so the way we've done it, uh, when we couldn't hire those people, uh, we actually found consultants, think of experts uh, that you pay by the hour, uh, and, and that's how we got the knowledge. But um, as we raised money and could afford it, we always looked for, um, you know, kind of the, the best people we could find for very specific uh, areas. So for manufacturing, we have someone who's got 20 plus years experience uh, in, in, in that space, uh, worked at different medical device companies, and then before that had a military experience, an interesting, interesting mix. Um, when, we, when we looked at digital health, we hired the uh, former chief technology officer for Athena Health, like a, a big success story here in the, in the Boston area. So that's kind of the caliber of people that we, we, we like to find. And of course, you know, we, we don't, uh, you know, it's a competitive market and you know, we don't always uh, get everyone we'd like, but, but, uh, but at least um, philosophically, that's how we're trying to, to put the team together. So it's great on both sides. I mean, the older generation loves to work with the younger generation because it's a very roll your sleeve type, uh, you know, culture. And of course, as you can imagine, conversely from the, the younger folks, it's an, an amazing opportunity. I mean, they're learning literally, I think in a few years, they, they can learn five to 10 years worth of experience, you know, in a couple of years. I think. Absolutely. So we push a lot of the responsibilities also down onto them. Mm -hmm. One, I always say one hour of a very good, deep conversation with somebody who's years ahead of you and who has that much more experience than you do is basically the equivalent of spending six months learning on your own. So these are, these are valuable things. That's that's right. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And if I, by the way, that's why also I went to business school. I and mean, that was exactly what I thought. I, I didn't think I could do it in three months. I thought it would take me 10 years. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, 
uh, first, you know, I really wanted to also, I'd, I'd been like kind of uh, running at breakneck speed, you know, all along. And I thought, okay, it'd be good just to take a step back and, and really study a, a new field and, and kind of be able to, you know, ask the right questions and then so on, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so the, so let's get into the, the flagship technology, a portal instrument. Sure. Yep. Medicines delivery uh, technology. Now, uh, could you explain a little bit about uh, how it works and what makes it so innovative? Yeah, so here's what's very interesting. So if you think of it, the, the, the Leland syringe is about 160 years old. It's probably one of the oldest medical device that hasn't been upgraded yet. Um, at the same time, also, uh, for some of your listeners, uh, maybe yourself as well, who's been in the field for some time, you know that there had been many attempts to do needle freedom delivery, at least since the 30s. And for some of the folks that were in the military, there had been attempts to use uh, you know, pressurized um, jets or explosions to, uh, like that would basically accelerate the drug to do um, injection but all of those led to um, very uh, painful ex uh, injections and also injections that were not complete so the painful can be more or less you know uh, accepted but if you cannot deliver the whole dose it's like you know what's the point of your technology and so that's been really the issue um, we have a, uh, a scientific founder who is uh, professor ian hunter from mit he is a very you know sort of you know White, uh, wild, wild thinker, I should say, had this idea that at the end of the day, you could create needle-free technology, uh, needle-free injection technology, um, by reducing it to an actuation problem. Uh, so, if you think of it, really, the way it works is that we pressurize the drug, and then we create a very fine jet from that drug. The, the jet can be way smaller than a needle and syringe. That's, that's actually the whole point. Um, but to create that very fast acceleration, you need some explosive form of energy release. So he thought, well. We could actually use an electric uh, linear actuator to do that. Uh, and once you introduce electricity, uh, you can actually computer control it. And so you could solve actually two issues. Number one, uh, you could actually uh, create on-demand power instantly because you, if you couple it with an energy source. And then using uh, you know, concepts from uh, the control theory, like, uh, like uh, you know, feedback uh, controlling, uh, you could actually make sure that you always got the same injection irrespective of you know any varying uh, physical parameters so that's kind of what we took eh? we licensed it from mit and then we we built it so it's a system that can inject any medicines and can use some needle free uh, and it doesn't matter doesn't matter what the drug does if the drug becomes more viscous the device will detect that in real time uh, and then we'll perform the same injection that is programmed to do. So it's like doing cruise control, you know, when you're on your car on a highway, uh, the car, you know, will maintain the speed irrespective of terrain uh, because it has a computer that, that monitors the speed of the wheels uh, and, and basically adjusts power from the engine uh, accordingly. So, so that was kind of the, the premise. And then uh, the whole challenge was to how, to how do you make a product out of it and it took us some, uh, some time. Yeah. So the, the the this is this is a very interesting device. This is a smart injector, really. It's it's a computer controlled injector, and really you can feed into it any type of of fluid. Yeah, um, let me just uh, bring it here. Should I start off? Sure, sure. Just, <laughs> why not? Why not? Uh, so, in fact, you'll be for a treat. I've got some uh, some cartridges here that I can uh, can actually fire. So, yeah. So you can basically so any medicines that's uh, at this time a fluid. In principle, we can also do. Uh, particle um, particle injections, but it is much more R&D that needs to go into that. Um, so the device comes in like this. It has basically a sleeve, um, and this is what it looks like. Actually, right here, this part. Okay. Uh, as you turn it on, basically it will open a door. So you need to just it like this, um, and then here you've got a cartridge uh, that basically just looks like a needle and syringe. Uh, but okay. for if you open open it, there is actually no needle. It's just a uh, inside here. There's a very tiny hole. It's about 150 micrometer. Um, so as you put the cartridge in, uh, basically the device um, uh, will will put on its safety measures. So here, right now, it's in a locked state, huh? and I won't inject myself. I just wanted just to demonstrate this. So if I position it correctly, it will basically unlock. So here it's locked. Huh? So I but only if it's positioned correctly does it unlock and here the inject button basically uh, lights up. So uh, then the device, uh, I can actually fire it. This is the demo version, so I'm going to try not to hit anything. Um, uh, I can basically bypass the safety. So here it just simulates uh, as if I was in contact and in the right position. And then if you're ready, three, two, one. So that's the injection right there. 
Wow. Uh, okay. I should saw that very clearly on the camera too. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so here it actually looks more impressive than, uh, you know, once you do it into something, uh, which we can do as well, but you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, let's, we can just move on. But here and then here basically it tells you you're done. So, so very quickly, you can literally transform the whole injection process. If this was um, the drug that, uh, a drug that's used for chronic uh, therapies, like think about uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, drugs that really, uh, or, or therapies or conditions that really need very serious, very complex drug, literally state of the art in the field of, of uh, biopharmaceutical, that injection would take a few seconds to actually do what you just saw today was 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. And it's always the same injection. Um, so those drugs get refrigerated, viscosity goes up. When they get refrigerated, the device will detect that and basically perform the same injection as well. Uh, so it's, it's, it's groundbreaking. Uh, everyone who's had an injection, including myself, as part of the studies that we've done, uh, really has said, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Once you have this available, what would you do with needle and syringe? Uh, but I can tell you about these challenges too, if, you, if you'd like to. to we'll, we'll get back to those, absolutely. I'm very curious. So uh, there are clearly a number of advantages to, to using this uh, device over a, a traditional needle and syringe, both in terms of, well, I mean, we can kind of go down the list. So I, I understand that patients would have a big preference for this kind of thing because you don't have the same anxiety as you would get if you were looking at, I mean, as soon as you see a syringe and a needle, a lot of people hate that sight in and of itself. It, it is anxiety, fear, um, all kinds of responses that might itself affect the, the, the response to the actual, to the drug or to the actual injection. It also, it's a lot faster than a traditional uh, needle. There's no kind of prepping. You just put it to your skin and uh, hit the button and it does the it does the job. Consistency is huge, uh, and uh, and also it can be used. So rather than having to go to a clinic or a hospital to get an IV, you would just be able to do this at home yourself. So it really puts all of that back into the hands of the patient to manage their own condition, their own treatment. That's right. That's right yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I, th I think you said all the right things. It's it's. Um I think what's, what we don't realize because, I mean, I don't know what you said, but I'm not a patient and, and I think people who are not patients don't realize, I mean, not only are you sick and that's, that's actually very debilitating. I mean, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you may not get out of bed if you don't get your, your medicine in the morning. Um, and, and then on top of that, you have the challenge of the delivery. And I think our challenge really as, as, uh, as a drug delivery company and I think for, for other drug delivery companies in, in the field is that by and large, the field of biopharmaceuticals is dominated by what the molecule can do. Uh, and so pharma doesn't think that this is a problem, actually. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, uh, raising any eyebrows, but I mean, this is just what we get from, from, you know, the majority, I would say, of, of, of companies that we're talking to. Now, of course, you know, you have innovators uh, as part of that field. And, and of course, a few people actually do get it. And, and I think that we're, we're tremendously bullish about this, this technology. But by and large, it's an interesting convergence that we have, you know, between this device world that uh, is very foreign, actually, to most pharma uh, from, from what we, we find. Mm -hmm. And so all, around all of this, I think the, the central theme, the central idea is really this, this concept of patient empowerment. It's that you don't have to rely on a provider or, um, or a, a setting such as a hospital or a clinic to be able to manage your own, your own health and your own condition. It's that you're by using the device, you're actually allowing patients to to take ownership and take control over their own health. A along that line, though, one of the things that I was curious to ask you about is, is there a way that a patient could overdose? Like how, what is, is there a fail safe within the mechanism? If a patient takes that medication rather than going to a clinician's office in that controlled environment, if they take it home, is there a mechanism to, to maintain that same level of safety? Yes, so the device actually uh, has a computer. It's an ARM chip, you know, very similar to what you've got in an iPhone. doesn't need to be as powerful, of course. Um, and so the device can be programmed to basically, um, you know, compare when an injection is done, uh, because there's a clock or so in, in the device actually as well, and then prevent you to do two injections, uh, you know, back to back, uh, if, if the period of time has been too short. That's a, the, the lovely thing about having a computer controlled device is that you can actually overlay many, many levels of safety. Um, so for some conditions, of course, you may not need to do that, but, but others uh, where, uh, you know, the cost of, of doing two premature injections back to back, you know, could be lethal. Of course, you want to prevent that. And I think here, uh, whereas with, with additional systems, you couldn't do this. Uh, here with this particular system, it would literally lock you out if it's not the right time. And again, 
you don't need this all the time, but for some conditions, we can certainly program that in. Yeah. One of the greatest compliments we get from our partners, if I may just add, because I think Absolutely. That so you may ask, you know, what's our biggest competition? Our biggest competition today are actually what's, what's existing. So it's not actually the Nylan syringe. Um, those are devices called uh, auto-injectors, which, you know, for the majority of people, it's like, well, what is this? Well, it's actually like an EpiPen, right? It's a syringe with a spring in the back. So the, the spring, when activated, basically shoots the needle in and then pushes the drug. Uh, so that's kind of the type of devices that we are, uh, competing ways and, and the greatest compliment we get from our partners from our pharmaceutical partners is oh gee portal you know every time um we want to change anything on the auto injector it takes us you know nine months to a year because you, know, you got to go back and redesign the device you got to you know manufacture it and then you got to you got to then you know uh, test it validate it and so on in our case we do that all of that we do in software okay you got a drug that's more viscous we go into the code we change one variable, we recompile it, in five minutes, you're done. And that's a long time. <laughs> so wow. that's, that's where I feel there is this amazing convergence happening right now. I think we're part of I feel we're part of it, which is you've got exciting development in biology, really groundbreaking stuff, but also you've got exciting things in devices. The cost of developing uh, devices and, and, and putting computation has gone dramatically down. And then you overlay now that it's, because it's computer control, you can actually get access to data just, just very, very easily. And then lay upon those, those machine learning concepts or AI, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that becomes very powerful and you can kind of feed back that information back into not only the, the the physicians, but also the, the therapy makers at the pharmaceutical companies and make the therapy better as well. So we, we, we're seeing this acceleration uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you know, is, is happening where, where basically everything is on a feedback loop of some sort. Uh, and, and that's tremendously exciting. Mm -hmm. So the, if you as a patient, you get this device, does it also come with an application of sorts that lets you monitor, track your own uh, activity? That's on correct, the device? yeah. That's correct. So, so you don't need the application to perform an injection, but if you'd like to augment your therapy, uh, you can you can basically access uh, you know the device parameters uh, using an app. Uh, the app will basically show you when your next dose is. Uh, it, it will tell you, you know, how well you've done on the treatment. Uh, I think very importantly, it will also provide you context. So it will provide you education on your disease. Okay, well, you're on, right now you're, you're at this stage and, and do this and that or, 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 or follow these types of, of tips, let's say. Uh, then, you know, you, you should see, uh, you, you should feel better. Um, so it will provide you that kind of information. Uh, of course, it will also tell you if the, the device needs to be recharged and all those kind of mundane things. So we think actually that not only the patients uh, will like this, because as you said yourself, you know, it, it, will, it will empower them. I think it will also change the conversation that they have with their physician, because now there's actually evidence that's literally generated by this device. And so they can talk about it instead of you know, wasting time during a doctor's visit to just gather the data, right? Which is you know, oftentimes what, what, what happens. Uh, and we think also pharmaceutical companies uh, or the drug developers, as, as we like to call them, they may find this information very, very interesting because now they would be able to know pretty much in real time how the drugs are getting used and getting, again, those feedback loops and, and, and getting closer to the patients and, and really understanding you know, what works and what, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we, we, we're very bullish about this field. And again, you know, I think here, the way we approach it is we can, of course, make it like super, super complicated. <laughs> Any engineer can do that. But I think let's just get to the essence, to the essence. You know, what's really important? What's kind of the minimum thing that we can do? Uh, we think that just, just having the device tell you when an injection was made and telling that to you in real time already with that opens a lot of possibilities. So very, very simple stuff if you think of it. Absolutely. Actually, on that point, so I'm thinking of two things off the top of my head. So one, of course, is this um, very prevalent idea of, of patient adherence or non-adherence really to medication uh, yes. because this is obviously a, it's a huge challenge for, for, for many patients and for many providers as well who really want to optimize the patients on a certain medication because that's the only way to actually achieve the results that, that are intended. But unfortunately, for many, many different reasons, it's very difficult for some patients to maintain the prescription, the required dose as, as prescribed by the physician. So if you're gathering information, if you're getting real-time notifications, you can take this medication at this time, that's another layer of push toward you know, adherence, intended adherence. 
that's correct. We can actually digitize some very simple uh, so-called escalation algorithms that have been tried and true uh, in a field of, of patient uh, adherence. Um, and basically escalate, you know, okay, you miss your dose once, or you get, a, uh, you know, you get a, an email or a text uh, message, but maybe if you miss it twice, you, know, you get maybe your wife or your, your spouse to call you, uh, or you get your physician to call you, things like that. So I think, I think all of this can be automated. It can be embedded in the platform. It's also very well known you know, in the field of rare diseases with, with companies like, uh, I'm thinking about Genzyme here, where literally, um, you know, members of teams at Genzyme, new patients by their first name. And, you know, think about what that actually does in terms of your ability to not only understand the treatment, but also, you know, being on it and so on. Uh, all of this is wonderful if you have a rare disease, but if it's a bigger disease population, it becomes, you know, impossible. I mean, no, no one has enough time uh, in, in their days to actually address that. So I think some of these things we can automate, we can, um, of course, we won't, we'll never replace a human, this is very clear, but, but some of the things can be automated, can be made simpler, uh, you know, much like, you know, when you get an Amazon delivery, where there's actually layers and layers of automation that's there, amazing, you know, advances in the field of operations research and so on. You don't see that, what you see is your, 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 the right package at the right time uh, at your doorstep. So, so, so all of this, I think, um, can be done also in, in our space, actually, as well, and provide some very unusual insights that, that for now, uh, I mean, as you know, um, the only way you know how, how medicines are used is you get basically um, a feeling, uh, you know, when, when the prescription is filled, you, that's the data you get. It, who knows what happens next? There's also a time delay uh, on, on that data and so on. And things I, th I think in your field, you, you would know very well. <laughs> that, that's correct. Yeah, we can dive into that topic a little bit more. Absolutely. But um, it, it, it's true. Uh, it's very, very difficult to, to track for large populations for, for things like chronic diseases or very highly prevalent diseases. Yep. What, patient, what patients are actually doing? What's their actual behavior? That's right, that's um, right. that, and, and, and by and large, we're not saying we're going to solve compliance. And that'd be very, mm -hmm. very foolish of us to say that. But, but we do think that, first of all, with a better device that's really patient centric, that's, I mean, I would say innocuous. I mean, there's, there's no needles. I mean, if you look at the cartridge, I'll just take here another one. I mean, there's nothing to be afraid of here. Uh, again, this is anecdotal, but you know, when, when I was injected a few dozen times, I was subject on our studies. To me, it's over before you even realize what's going on. It's just like a tickle, right? And so, interestingly, doing the injection yourself, and we're talking here, this is not your typical vaccine. This is like a one ml volume. So, what does it mean? It's, it's basically like, like the equivalent of doing two to three vaccines back to back, right? And so, it's, it's, it's very daunting, and, and certainly. Uh, doing the needle part is, is not easy. And, and so think of it, if you're a patient who is maybe a little bit older, who has dexterity challenges, who doesn't understand the context, it, it becomes very, very challenging. So what we're saying is that a you know, better device with a little bit of digital health or, or some you know, patient engagement, patient management or disease management tools, we should see an improvement on, on the adherence side. And I think adherence to us is one of those tragedies because at the end of the day, it's a mis opportunity that's there for you to be treated but there's so many reasons you know not to do it first of all it's denied well i'm not that sick okay well that's that's a challenge or i, I feel good today right that's actually even the, the bigger challenge that people have or i don't want to i'm afraid of needles it's too complicated all of that i think we can certainly at least portions of it we can address just today uh and so that's why we're also quite bullish about our ability to, to transform that it's not only you know um, better for the patients, it's also better for the entire healthcare system, right? less hospitalization, less uh, more acute forms of diseases down the line and so on. So, so, so that's, that's uh, I think, an amazing opportunity that's, that's there and, and we'd love to contribute uh, with, with what we do. Mm -hmm. You also touched on an interesting idea of um, uh, like patient preferences really because I think we're, we're in an era where, and there's a parallel with the Amazon uh, example that you gave as well, there's, typically there's a variety of options for, for people um, outside of healthcare and even within healthcare in, in many cases as well. So, so th this is an opportunity for patients to exercise their preferences in terms of one treatment or one modality versus another. And so because of that, I think you end up getting a situation where there's, there's pushback, right? So maybe a physician thinks they should do it this way. The patient says, I don't really want to do it that way. I want to do it a different way. So introducing options and that, that'll fit a certain patient's lifestyle and, um, and preferences, I think that that's a huge opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, in fact, 
um, this is not revealing anything confidential here. Um, one of our um, strongest partners is a company called uh, Takeda. It's a, a global pharmaceutical company. Um, they have an interesting therapy in the field of um, inflammatory bowel diseases. It's a very dramatic um, a disease very debilitating. Personally, you need to basically run to the toilet all the time just to put it in limits terms here. Uh, and you know, this is this is not not fun. And so they're worried because this actually targets a, a younger patient population. Is that um, you know those patients may not want to do complicated therapy. So let's make it super easy. And also they may expect uh, some form of value on a on a digital side, right? I mean, why why is this therapy not integrated with my digital life? So 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 we can help them there with with what what we do, and that's how we have this this partnership today. Absolutely, and that's what I wanted to ask you about that as well. So Takeda is one of the partnerships that you have, yes. and. And I, I believe it's so. It's an ongoing partnership, and, and like you said, the idea was to uh, develop a, a system to uh, help patients with with IBD, and specifically with with Crohn's and with uh, colitis as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, how is that development going? If, uh, if I can ask. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's going great. I mean, they have a, a fantastic drug that that is very different. Um, um, in a way, it's treat, the disease is treated now, and then I think on our side we have a very different device in the way uh, administration uh, gets done. I think I think the the two kind of best in class, if I may say so, uh, kind of you know combination leads to some unusual unusual products. So you know I think it's interesting because we uh, you know strategically we decided not to be a, a therapeutics company. Uh, we felt that uh, you know there were experts there that, that really knew do that way better than us. But on the other hand, we are experts in our field in, in a device development. Uh, and it's kind of this, this very uh, flavorful version of, of devices that we're producing. Um, so it's almost like a match made in heaven because each side not only trusts each other, but also brings in something to the table that the other doesn't have. And, and that to us is kind of really a match made in heaven because that's a true version of a, a, true, 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 a true partnership, so to say. Uh, this is one where you know one is abusing the other. It's these kind of things, right? So, mm. so, so I think I think that's that's wonderful, and, uh, and certainly we, we we are putting together other partnerships with that same spirit. Um, what what I tell the team all the time: we want to be the easiest company to partner with because our whole value proposition is actually to be complementary to uh, the pharma world. Uh, and and you know, pharma is, is is a different business. It's a very tough business um, because it it. Um, requires a level of quality uh, and processes that, that are probably one of the highest in this world. I mean, even anything that's in the food value chain, so to say, doesn't get the same uh, stringent uh, quality procedures and, and standards and so on. And so they're very demanding, and they should be, you know, as a, as a, as a company. And so I think as a startup, that's one of the things that you need to adapt to as well and understand. Uh, that you know when they make requests, it's for, typically for good reasons as well. <laughs> Absolutely, that the, the regulatory environment when it comes to to healthcare uh, to to bring a new medicine or a new technology uh, to market is um, it, it, it's 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 very complex and, and it's daunting for for many people. And actually, this brings us back to I think one of the points that we first, we first started talking about is if you're a researcher and you're starting uh, a company or thinking about starting a company to bring a new therapy to market, there are huge regulatory hurdles that that most people are not really aware of. Certainly not if if you're used to working in a in a purely research basic research environment. Um, so it, it's a very complex field, absolutely. And Correct. and you've you've mentioned before that one of your one of your big successes in your careers is is, uh, is successfully getting uh, funding to to fund your ventures, and I'm wondering how uh, how did this go about? Like, how did this experience happen um, with uh, with the Takeda example specifically? Yeah, I, mean, I think I think you know ideas are great, huh? and we all get ideas. You know, I don't know when we brush our teeth every morning or, or shave. You know, for the men here, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, if you don't get them funded, you know, who cares? So, so I think I think funding is um, fundraising is probably one of the hardest things. As I mentioned, you know, um, in my previous venture of Synaptics, it took us a year initially to raise a fund for Portal. The economic context was a little bit better, so that it took seven months to bring the first money in. Uh, it came in the form of a convertible note from a, an investor here in Boston. And then it took us another, I would say, six months to actually get now more money uh, so we could actually hire people. So I just raised money so I could actually get things started. And then only 
a few months later, could we actually, uh, you know, hire people? Uh, so I think, yeah, it's hard. At the end of the day, um, you know, I think I think what's interesting is that you, um, there, there is no uh, recipe there. I think, I mean, there are, you know, the form is, is kind of always the same. You know, you talk about, you know, the, the problem that you're trying to solve, the solution that you bring in, what the industry is like, what the competition is, what you go to market is, what the financials look like, and also how you're going to make things, what's the plan. That's typically what you talk about. But then, you know, how you are successful at funding is almost like finding a spouse, you know. I mean, you, you just don't know <laughs> until you're in the market. So, so, so I think here, I mean, again, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of advice online, but, you know, the more you talk to people and you try to fundraise, the more, the more you, you get, uh, you know, you get, uh, you learn something and actually you're able to correct the next time. But I think, you know, a pitch typically, uh, you know, takes a good, again, my experience here, I mean, it takes a good six months to get into like a form that's really presentable. But of course, you know, you can actually start to present it before that. And uh, mm-hmm. um, in fact, some people, I, somehow we've never done that because we, I think we're very opportunistic, but, but, you know, some people, what they do, they, they have three tiers of, uh, of venture funds that they're targeting, they start at the bottom tier and move their way up. But you know, on the other hand, you know, fundraising is very demanding. If you could get it done sooner, well, with the best people you can find, it, well, you should do that. So why not just go to the first, uh, you know, people that are the tier one and that you 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 actually could potentially raise from. So I, I think that that's what we would do. Um, it's very bold. That's a very bold move. <laughs> well, that's what you do. I think as an entrepreneur, you need to be bold. Yeah. I don't know why. Time is literally money. I think your own time is probably the most valuable commodity that you've got, right? And so, uh, so if if that opportunity again, sometimes the opportunity may not be there, so it may be a moot point. But if someone is interested enough because of who you are, what you've done, or because of this idea that you have, of course you should go and, and go talk to them, and and uh, and maybe that it could be a strategy where you go all in, or you maybe you show a little bit or provide advice. I mean, one of the old added. And suddenly, I, it never happened to me, but you know, one of the old adages is that if you ask for money, you get advice. If you ask for advice, you get money. So <laughs> that that latter point never happened to us. So I don't know, <laughs> I've heard this stuff. It sounds like either way, you you win. So it's a win-win. <laughs> Yes. And uh, I see many, many uh, different applications uh, to, to this technology. Uh, you mentioned that you're, you're also um, looking at uh, additional uh, partnerships or maybe other um, avenues to, to help even more patients. Is there anything in the books right now or any other indications? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So, in fact, this was the hardest challenge we had when we started the company. I mean, um, as you said, rightfully, this is a platform technology uh, it can be used for a lot of things on the medical side, but also on, on other areas. It could be used for industrial applications, actually, as well. So what we really had to do, the work, actually, that took about a year, I think. The work we really had to do is to figure out, well, where is the greatest value we can get for this technology today? But not like in five years, like today. And so we realized that there was this class of medicines uh, that had this challenge that they needed to be injected regularly. So that's good because that's repeat customers, but also where the price of the drug would be actually um, high enough that uh, it would be worth a while. So it's almost like you know, the, the Tesla model in that they didn't do actually the, the mass market model three first, they actually first got the, the super niche, you know, high performance car that, that people actually, a uh, very, very select group of people could actually pay for. So we kind of went, uh, after the same, the same uh, kind of with the same strategy, really looking for um, uh, those type of applications, and in biologics, those, those medicines that need to be injected chronically is what we found. Um, and so, so that's traditionally what we're doing today. We're going to, you know, we think there's about a hundred deals like this that we can do uh, with the, the Takeda like, and uh, and interestingly, to be profitable, we only need a handful of them, which is which is wonderful. Um, and um, uh, and so how do we approach how do we approach partnership is really your question i think here we cannot be like in a mentality where we we go fast and break things right because we make one mistake uh, god forbid we have one record that would be a very tough um, thing to recover from so what we want to do is find partners uh, like our friends at takeda for example who are tremendously committed and believe in what we do uh, and really believe in this idea of partnership, which is that they're not going to be, uh, you know, sort of, sh- um, what is it called again in English, sort of, um, you know, second guessing everything that we do. I and mean, of course, they're gonna, they can ask tough questions. That, that, of course, that's always the case, but um, there shouldn't be any duplicative efforts basically going on there. It should be really truly 
you know, synergistic, uh, uh, sort of, you know, complementary and so on. Um, and so what, what we're doing, we're looking for those partners. We, we're very deliberate. You know, we, we really want to find that, that sort of commonly shared value um, because again, I, th I think the cost of making mistake at, at, at this this stage would be very very costly as well. But but down the line, I mean, the, you saw the the vision is a needle free world, and even though this device may look a little expensive, it's actually not. But uh, may look a little expensive. What's interesting is that the cartridge uh, is actually very cheap. Um, so if you reuse the device, its cost if you do like a thousand injections a day. It's, it's, it's cost goes down to zero after one day, literally. Uh, and so it's all based on the disposable because the disposable has literally no needles on a first principle basis. It should be cheaper than its uh, cousin, the needle and syringe, which has a needle and, and, and metal as such. So we even think that at some point, as we write down the cost curves, that we could actually have a tremendous value proposition in a developing world as well. So you know, it will take some time, but, but I, think, I think to us it's very clear that uh, you know, down the line, at least on a first principle basis, it's, it's possible to do that. I would love to do that. I think needle and syringes are they efficient in that, you know, you, you get the stuff in, but there's a lot of trade-off that you have to deal with from, you know, things we talked about, you know, patients, uh, you know, being you know, super scared about it. Uh, the safety part, I think, is, is, is just, uh, you know, I think unacceptable. Um, you know, needle and syringe, you know, that you find on the beach, uh, you know, God forbid one of your kids, uh, you know, runs on it and it's pretty great. I mean, this is horrible. In, all day, in this day and age, that shouldn't be an issue actually at all, but it certainly is. Even in a developed, in a developed world, it is. And so we want to be, make this something of the past. And then of course, the cost of disposing uh, needle and syringe is also something that no one talks about, but it's very weird. We have patients actually that are part of our, our team. They describe situations that in their home, they have all those shops uh, you know, containers because very few institutions actually take them back. And so what can you do? You can be mindful and actually store them at your home or you can be mindless and just literally store them on the trash. I'm sure that happens more than we think. And so anyway, I think all of this needs to be something of the past. And I think, I think uh, society should support that as well. I'm glad you're thinking really big. You even uh, tapped into this, uh, the public health space and, and how the implications could be very positive for, for public health because their, their entire, uh, there's, a, there's a research field um, uh, in public policy field that is all about uh, needles and how to get the, those disposed of safely and yes. out of reach of, of children, uh, you know, especially within a household setting. And so it's a big area for sure. Does that, we even think at some point, I mean, if really you're, we're worried of someone misusing it want to do it like in the iphone where you've got like a little uh fingerprint reader uh that basically unlocks the device only for you at the right time i mean so you know what if the device could talk to you actually like siri right oh it's time for your medication and have you checked this in this uh latest study that shows that you know if you do um you know injections repeatedly someone like you a patient like you you know has seen you know on average this and this outcome i think this the, the, the field you know if you combine them as, as we just discussed the area of, of this amazing renaissance in biology the feel of those advanced devices plus you know everything that's going on on the it's you know internet uh, so i mean i think i think the, it's just very exciting i think what, what could happen and, i think the opportunities the of, are endless less cost for the system which which certainly i mean i, th I think is is, uh, is something we should everything we do should be actually driven towards that and, and, and we think we, we can help them absolutely absolutely and uh, i want to ask you a question also about uh, the about data and the data that's been collected through the system now you've said that um one of the areas that has the biggest potential impact on patient care and therapy through the technologies that are being developed at, at portal instruments uh, include the integration of therapy management everything from genetics all the way to a cloud-based information management system Yes. So how do you envision that the technology, um, this drug delivery uh, device, how is that going to contribute to this, this integration? Yeah, I think, I think here, what, first of all, I think, I think the, um, one of the other areas that doesn't get a lot of credit, I think, is the field of diagnostics. As I like to say, my first love uh, was diagnostics, or it still is diagnostics. And, and I think there is tremendous value that's there, but it's very hard to unlock it as a business model because the therapies actually get all the value, which is great because at the end of the day, really, you want to cure people, right, if you can, or you want to chronically treat them if there's no other option. Um, but I think, I think on the genetic side, we're really learning so much about 
what happens at the cellular process, uh, just from understanding the deep biology, but also doing more practical things like, you know, really like characterizing very clear patient population. It actually can go beyond, it can be metabolomics, it can be uh, a lot of things. I think there's that data that's there. Um, then there is, um, you know, of course, all the, the clinical study data that's out, out there too. And then I think there's a drug delivery side uh, which we can help with. And I think we can be part of that. Of course, you know, we're not going to be, we don't want to be this um, sort of, you know, we're not going to be the driving force to create the standard, but we want to be supporting the standard. Uh, you know, we want to be uh, basically part of that ecosystem. Uh, and and if we have to, I mean, I think there's other people doing a lot of things, but if we have to, we would actually bolt it down on the company and actually kind of you know, build the whole stack. I mean, it's, you, I mean, again, it would be like way, way too big here, but you could imagine uh, it wouldn't be far-fetched to combine everything that I've just described. I think nowadays, the capital requirements to get a fully integrated, uh, you know, actually therapeutics company that would not only start with a genetics uh, disease biology all the way down to molecule development, then the device side, and then the IT infrastructure. I mean, someone may do that. I don't know if it's going to be us, but I think it would be way too big. But, but conceptually, I think it's possible to do that. And once you've got all the, the value stack that's there, imagine the synergies and the speed at which you can actually develop therapies, right? And so you could look at it from a very narrow field of one disease area, right? Where you could kind of have this concept of feedback mechanism kind of, you know, coming in, making things better and, and so on. Or it could be across, you know, if, if we think that adherence is like the, the biggest untackled problem there, you could think about, you know, how experiences in different therapeutic areas in the area of, of adherence could actually have re repercussions in other areas too. And you could use machine learning to actually find that out much quicker than having someone look at the data. So I think that's, that's how we're very, very bullish. And, and again, if we have to, and we can raise capital, of course, to do it, we will do it. But I think most likely what will happen is that um, a big consortium formed and, and, and we'll be part of it. I think one thing that, that fascinates us very, very much is the area of data structures. Uh, you know, who will be the dominant uh, medical record system is it going to be you know the Apple uh, care kit or, or uh, uh, medical kit? I forgot actually what it's called now. Or will it be Epic, you know the uh, the final the, the, the sort of the legacy uh, uh, sort of system. I think it's very exciting to to look at how those those, uh, those will uh, kind of shape up. Mm. You were talking about a bit of a hybrid company where it's not just a uh, a it's a, it's an entire health care kind of mini system in and of itself where it not only takes care of drug development uh, therapeutic development but also the delivery of it through uh, better uh, care management so we're, we're talking about things like um, what, what is the what is the best way to optimize a delivering services and therapies to a patient whether that's you know in the patient's home or getting them on the phone to talk through a telehealth system with the physician um, getting real-time information about how the patient's responding and reacting and how they're feeling um, through things like patient reported outcomes uh, directly so this is an entire kind of ecosystem built into yes, this, this, com this, this visionary company that's correct. I, th I think, yeah, in particular, this is the thing that really fascinates us because um, the tech to actually put together a, um, like this sort of, you know, patient management system that you just described, is actually not very hard. You can use, it's all, all there, all, all available. Uh, and and I, think, I think it requires, you know, good understanding of also the ecosystem, all the stakeholders and so on, which I, th I think is where the, the hard part is, but on the tech side, it's, it's quite simple to do that. Even the computing power you can get from Amazon, uh, you know, web services uh, these days. Uh, but it's really linking, if you think of it, the hard part is, is linking all those different disciplines that historically haven't really spoken to each other. And you can, you can see that every relationship is, 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 as you go deeper and deeper, it becomes harder and harder. Uh, as well. And I would say the second big challenge, I think, is just getting people who are used to doing things in a certain way to then adapt to a brand new system and a brand new way of doing things. And oftentimes, whenever that happens, and I think this is this is characteristic of, of healthcare, is that there is a lot of resistance. It, it's not the same thing as if you're in a tech, purely tech environment where everything is just about doing the next big innovative thing and breaking old uh, records and, and old perspectives and innovating constantly. Healthcare is a little bit laggy in that sense. I think, I think that's very true. And, and I'll give you an example that, that may sound a little bit like left field, but it's very true. I think what, because at the end of the day, there's so much capital that's tied into the healthcare system. It's very hard to untie that. And here, I mean, we've had, 
to actually learn that on her own uh, for something that's very, very mundane actually compared to the big ideas that you described, which is this cartridge here. Um, we had to realize that we actually needed to make that cartridge backwards compatible with what Fama was using to fill it. Because to fill those cartridges, to set up the line that literally puts the drug in is a hundred million dollars minimum. So if your wow. device and your cartridge is not compatible with this, no one's gonna no one's gonna adopt your sexy technology, even though you may be super sexy, it doesn't matter, right? It's just too it's too difficult. And I think I think you can use that very mundane example and, and use it just to describe the healthcare system. Um, you know, it's it's there's so many processes and the cost of a mistake is literally someone dying. Uh, so I think that's what's at stake. But but on the other hand, I think like the example I just provided you can make things backwards compatible, right? And I think that's the place to start. Uh, and and you, maybe there's other areas you can be disruptive in, but if you can be backwards compatible, at least there's a reason uh, or an opportunity for, for folks to adopt part of what you do, and then you can kind of, uh, you know, um, sort of, you know, uh, work from within. I think, I think one of the interesting examples, and again, this is just using Tesla as well, uh, but I do find it fascinating that once you remove the in, um, once you remove the internal combustion engine and replace it by a motor that's literally like this size. So you think about like on a volume size, it's got to be like a five to one or not, maybe five to five, eight to one difference in size. The car could look anything. It doesn't have to look the way it, it does because the engine is not there anymore. Uh, but I think, I think if you did that, that would be way too much tech to or just, just uh, again, a feeling really of tech to, to bring. And it'd be very hard for people to adopt because, you know, they wouldn't recognize the car anymore. It'd be de facto something else. So what I think Tesla has done brilliantly, uh, not only have they actually hidden the technology, they also made the car, of course, look, look very cool and sexy as well. So I, th I think that's, that's maybe the key for healthcare as well. You have to kind of make it look like what it is, but underneath it has all the innovation that's, that's there. And I think here, and again, just to bring it back to, to our case, that's, that's really what we've done here with this cartridge. But, you know, on, on healthcare IT processes, you can certainly do that. Just make the interface, you know, look kind of vaguely similar to what they do now, where they order things and so on. But on the knee side, you could have this amazing engine that automates like a lot of things that right now people are using fax machines for. Um, mm -hmm. I, absolutely, absolutely. The, uh, it, it's true. Un, under the hood, it's a completely different thing. But on the surface, it kind of looks like it's the same thing. But in fact, it works completely differently. It's a very interesting point. Yeah. Uh, on a final note, uh, Patrick, uh, I wonder if you can uh, give us a, another example um, of a success story. It could be either from a, a patient, a healthcare provider, a partner, a business partner, or otherwise, um, that has been impacted positively by, by the work that your company is doing. So, so specific, so a patient or some someone that has been impacted by. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I think um, you know because we are uh, you know trading in a very regulated environment. You know, we're still uh, at the pre-launch stage. You know, from a regulatory standpoint, but nonetheless, we do get actually patients to come in. Um, and if if you if you go on YouTube and you look at our YouTube channel, you can actually find patients who literally talk about what it would mean to have our device. And and again, we always. I mean, so um, touched actually by by what it really means for them. Again, I'm not a patient, uh, and 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 uh, and, but I'm sure I will be at some point. I mean, the one eventually <laughs> becomes a patient. The last. I'm crossing my fingers. Uh, Hopefully uh, not. Knock on wood. I mean, I mean, I mean by that. And so I think, I think, I think we can, in an area where literally um, there hasn't been any innovation you almost wonder if people really care. I, mean, I do think people care, but nonetheless, it, it leads you to wonder if that's okay. I think, I think we can provide, I think, a lot of hope huh, that, um, you know, I mean, in our case, again, um, compared to, you know, preparing the injection, in some cases too, in, in the old days, they literally had to, you know, mix the solution themselves and so on. And so with, with auto-injectors, those with EpiPen, certainly that's, that's easier, but nonetheless, you have to wait half an hour for the device to warm up because otherwise it won't work. So in our case, you're done in like 30 seconds and that would be a long time. You know, I mean, the cost of the, the injection, the injection time is under a second. It's like, you know, even actually under 0.5 seconds. So the whole thing, you could be literally grabbing the cartridge, putting it into the device, inject it, toss the cartridge, put the device back in its core, and then you're done. That's like 30 seconds. 
boom. <laughs> so I think, it, believe it or not, it may sound very modern, but it actually has a lot of meaning for those patients. And, 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 and those conversations to us are, are very, very impactful. And, and the team actually really, really enjoys, uh, um, you know, sort of just you know, listening to that and, and, and realizing the impact that, that, that this will have. And I've watched those videos too, and, and I love hearing uh, patients' firsthand experience, uh, seeing that, uh, going back to an old injector, an old uh, syringe and needle, they, they feel extreme anxiety, extreme fear, yes. and, uh, and, and this offers an alternative that just takes all of that away. It's a wonderful thing to hear. I will tell you another funny story because it's, it's like very, very, um, just, just to happen now. We, we're doing, you know, as you can imagine, you know, uh, alas, you know, one has to do animal studies, you know, and so on. We just did one, uh, one and, and literally the, um, the, the operators performing the injections were like, okay, oh, we keep the device because that would make our life easier. And actually, again, this we did not, not expect. Uh, this is one of those things where you want to have a, a video camera basically just you know, <laughs> filming everything we're doing. Um, again, I think I think it's easy. I think in the um, you know just to take things for granted that there is you know I'll be a little bit you know, hopeless you know so oh, things like this like an instrument. Well, that's the best we can do, and and it kind of give up, right? And I think I think here again the hope that we're providing and the the, the, the differentiation and, and the um, sort of the value is, is I think it's, I think is really really there. Uh, it's it's um it's almost like the, the famous uh, you know Henry Ford uh, quote, which is that I and mean, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would ask they would have asked for a faster horse. You know? <laughs> so you know if if it's not something that you're uh, acutely working on, you, you may not realize that there's actually a lot of room of innovation right? that's that's there in very modern things that we have. And I think I think beyond also what we're doing, I think a lot of medical devices. Um, are kind of being looked at more closely and people are asking the right question, which is, well, can we do better now that we have access to all this unlimited computing uh, availability, this, all these design tools, all this, this multidisciplinary knowledge and so on, can we actually do better than, than the fait accompli? And so I, th I think that's a tremendously exciting area and, and it's compounding too, right? We can use the tool, it's always better. And so there's this acceleration that, that, we, that, that is there and, and that, that's, that's, that's amazing. Patrick, I'm glad that there are teams out there like yours working on the brand new, very innovative things that are going to bring a lot of value to patients, uh, healthcare providers, and really health systems ultimately. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and really inspiring actually hearing uh, your story, uh, going from being a researcher to an equity analyst to, to now a co-founder and CEO. So we wish you success on your journey and uh, we hope you continue to, to dream big, uh, to believe in yourself, to work hard, and to make things happen. Uh, absolutely. My pleasure. And again, if I can be helpful uh, to you or to your, your audience, uh, always feel free to, to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is very simple to guess. It's firstname.lastname uh, at Portal Instruments or patrick.anchorteal at portalinstruments.com. And uh, yeah, um, look forward to hearing from, uh, from you and, uh, and your audience uh, as, as time goes on. Wonderful. And we'll include a, a link uh, to, to your information as well. Thank you so much. To Most our welcome. My pleasure. To our listeners uh, out there, we'll see you next time.